there was a time in my life when I was about to just quit theological education. I felt it was irrelevant. I was not doing what it, education ought to do. And uh, I thought if we could do something like what the demon is now, I didn't know, I didn't call it that, but uh, this would be what theological education ought to do. And uh, I think you're doing it here. We try to stab at it at uh, Gordon Conwell. And if you're debating whether you ought to be involved in a program, try it. I think uh, Kent and uh, Don Sanuki and uh, you've got some good people here and uh, <coughs> worth a shot. And, uh, uh, and it, it's just good to keep growing, developing. So I, I commend it to you. And uh, that will double my honorarium. At least. <laughs> <laughs> the contract actually says it's a commission, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get 15% of everybody shines up. I, uh, it's hard to talk about all the different changes, but one thing I think has changed, and it's influenced by television. I think that uh, you don't have enough time now to fool around before you preach. I think uh, introductions have taken on a greater significance than they had in the past. I think that comes because uh, when you turn on a television program, a major uh, program made for television, uh, they know that they have literally 20 seconds to get you to listen. Uh, we have clickers in our hands, and if you don't, if you haven't turned the program on deliberately, you click it, it takes off. You've got 150 channels, you never come back. So um, it used to be, you, could, you know, last week we're in Genesis 32, and next week we'll be in Genesis 33. And if you know your math, we should be at Genesis 34, you know, and uh, I just don't have the time to do that anymore. Uh, the uh, television and how we watch it has changed all kinds of things. They know they better get you in 20 seconds. And people come to church with clickers in their heads. And, uh, <laughs> they like it or not, and uh, that's, that's one change. I mean, the whole structure of the sermon changes. I think a second thing that uh, I see happening is the method of delivery. I think we talk with an audience more than we talk to them, and certainly more than we talk at them. Uh, this, that conversational sort of tone that uh, is very much influenced again by the media. Uh, I think to stand up and holler at an audience, uh, you may feel like doing that as a preacher, but you ought not do it. And uh, uh, if you watch, <laughs> uh, television. My daughter was on the NBC station in Corpus Christi for a while. They do everything to make it look like she's just talking to the audience. I mean, they have a uh, machine that you know, has a script, but that script goes on with the eye contact always directed at the audience. You can't afford to be something different in church. People expect that you're gonna talk with them. So I think those are things that, uh, the whole mode of preaching has changed because of, of the media. Good, thank you. If there's a, um, if there's a, a genre of the Bible that might uh, that you would recommend we really master for today, <laughs> well, what would it be? If I'm right about what I just said about the media, one of the nice things is that when uh, the Bible communicates, it communicates its story. The writers of the Old Testament were theologians, and they communicated their theology through story. Uh, if you read the stories of the Old Testament, if you ask, what do we learn about God from the story, you get all kinds of insight. But they don't uh, hammer it, but they deliver it that way. 
So we are fortunate that when our Lord was here, he used parables, metaphors, stories. Old Testament uses stories. And uh, to be able to read those stories perceptively is an important thing today because I think we can preach through stories. And uh, the tendency is for us to think that when you use stories, you're not doing really, you know, <laughs> good work. Uh, it's interesting to me that in the Apostles' Creed, the whole teaching ministry of Jesus is dismissed with a semicolon. He was born of the Virgin Mary, semicolon, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, buried. Uh, well, you know, he, anybody just runs around telling stories about kids who've gone to the far country, or guys who are beaten up on the road. Uh, he, you know, he, he's got to do better than that. Um, but that's what he did. So. Uh, the ability to tell stories that are relevant, not just the ability to tell a story, but it's relevant. It's what the Bible is in. I think is a skill that you ought to develop today. My rule for questions and answers, I got two answers, so if you can guess what the question is, my question, <laughs> ask the question, we're home free. Who thinks they can guess the right question? Well, you reminded me of something when you mentioned the 22nd uh, introduction. Um, at our church, we actually have a time limit. Oh, thank you. At our church, wow. At our church, we have a uh, sort of a time limit we're restricted to, and so our sermons we keep to about 20 minutes. And I know at a lot of churches they run 45 minutes or so. And what I'm actually wondering is if you've seen whether in the culture people are more apt to listen or take something from a shorter sermon, or if is it, is it better to go for the, uh, the home sermons run? sermons have a way of expanding to fill the time that's given. I think if you quit when you're through, you can preach longer. Okay. Uh, I, you know, a good sermon has a sense of unity. Huh. <laughs> a good sermon has a sense of unity, a sense of order, a sense of progress. This feeling that it's moving, it's going someplace. So if on some Sundays you quit in 20 minutes because that's what you have to say, that's fine. Other Sundays, if you go to 25, 30 minutes in a church like that, people will excuse you because they know you quit when you're finished. Uh, but uh, very few people will tell you they want you to be shorter. I was, uh, did a survey with the Christianity Today and. Uh, the pastors all said they ought to preach 30 minutes, that kind of thing. But the people didn't say that. They ought to quit when he's through. Uh, usually, they, you know, you can't do that all the time. You let the kids loose on you. They come shooting through the auditorium. But uh, 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 it's hard to talk about time that way. Uh, but there is, if you get used to 20 minutes, you'll stay within 20 minutes. I'm used to 25 to 30 minutes, and uh, I can land this <laughs> at that time. Uh, I preached at Grace Chapel for a number of months, and they had it down to 20 minutes because they were on the radio. I, <laughs> I said, I don't think I could do that. I don't know how long a 20-minute sermon is. <laughs> I mean, intuitively, I. I could, tell you, I could tell you what a 30 minute pro is, I could tell you what 12 and a half minutes are because I do that on the radio. But uh, anyhow, I don't think there's any answer to it. I do most of the preaching there and, and I lose track of time. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I just get, I finish. When I get through, I get through. And sometimes it's 20 minutes, sometimes it's 25. Uh, very rarely do I go 30, but but I'm uneducated. <laughs> if, so. if the crowd is still with you after you preach for 30 minutes, that's fine. If they quit at 20, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got 10 minutes there, you got to fill. Go. 
I was just going to ask you about the uh, central idea of a message, which is so important. Um, what are some helpful ways that you have come up with to help you get to that central idea? I mean, what is the process in your mind, your thinking, that helps you to reveal it uh, from the passage? It's tougher to get it when you're doing narrative literature because the writer may not give it to you. Or if they state it for you, it's in the mouth of maybe a minor character. Um, in the epistles, it's, it's right there. The nature of an epistle is it, it deals with thought. It may come at the end of the passage, so it leads up to it, or at the beginning of the passage leads out of it. Um, I have found in working with the narrative literature to ask the question, what do I learn about God from this passage? Because if the writer is telling me about God, then I, I ought to ask that question. I do it because that helps me get to what he's driving at. Uh, it also gives me an idea of how much of this narrative I can take and use. Folkman, who is a Jewish scholar, says that there is not a detail in any of the stories, and he studied them all, that's wasted. They all contribute to the message of the writer. I have found that helpful because <laughs> at that times when I think, I don't know what that's doing here in the story. But often if I pursue that, that's where the idea is, is buried. So, uh, By the way, uh, he, he's written a book on reading biblical narrative. It's, most of his uh, commentary is given to people who have some knowledge of the Hebrew text. But that's one written for English readers, so you might find that helpful. Yes. Here we are. First of all, thank you for your work and, and honor your, uh, your good, good help through the years. Um, in preaching to a skeptical culture, it seems that uh, I have to assume less about what the audience knows and about what they're willing to buy into, including the authority of scripture for one. I find myself drawn towards two things, one is taking longer in the introduction to sort of work with what I think their barriers are. And secondly, using less of the text or you know, not trying to cover as much, not assume as much, which feels counterintuitive related to the fact that I know they're biblically illiterate and that's you know, one of my motivations. But in order to be helpful, um, it feels like those two things have to happen. That the, the text has to be introduced a little later after I wrestle with what I think their barriers to it are going to be, to engage them solidly, and then secondly, to, to not try to cover as much. Uh, any thoughts or advice about, about that tension? Because, of course, you know, what the, you know what the expectations of the evangelical community are related to doing either one of those. Well, I know that as I have gotten older, my motto is less is more. When I left seminary, more was more. <laughs> uh, but uh, and I think it's particularly true today because people really don't know the Bible. And uh, when uh, I did this survey with Christianity Today, we asked uh, pastors what they thought the people believed about racial issues, economic issues, a whole bunch of issues. And consistently, pastors overestimated the uh, knowledge and attitudes of their people. The best of the communicators <laughs> were closer, but not one of them was where the people are. Uh, so you're speaking to what I think is the condition today. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you talk down to them. It doesn't mean you trivialize the message. But you just can't say as much. And better to say something well than to say nothing or say something poorly. It seems obvious. Uh, 
I am amazed at the, how that has changed over the years. How um, there's a group in your church, if they've been around a long time, they have a, a knowledge base. But the other people who come, new people, just don't have the knowledge base. And so you have to be sure that when you tell them a story, you tell them a story, but you can't go into all the details if you have only 25 minutes. So, uh, but you're speaking to what I think is one of the great problems of our day. Uh, and I think there's the other thing as you're saying, I think the only thing you can count on in the people in the congregation is a sense of skepticism. Um, we often talk as though everybody understood it, the Bible, but more than that, we talk about uh, things as though there were miracles every half hour in the ancient world. And uh, people were risen, raised from the dead, people, you know, and water to, to wine. And we talk about it without any sense that this is unusual. And the guy who comes in out of the cold says, what kind of, he got that with Bill Moore. And, you know, he, he kind of be kidding me. Uh, he get to the Garden of Eden, the first stories. You have a snake talking to a woman. And we talk about it as though Everybody had a talking snake in the garden. <laughs> and the snake said this, and the serpent said that. And the guy who comes in, even the folks who've been there a while, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, so we take for granted as preachers what the guy in the eighth row for us, he said, it doesn't take for granted. That world of the Bible is a different world than the world that uh, he lives in. Um, and uh, I'm writing a, hopefully, writing a book on application. And once you come to the Bible and say, how do you take the Word of God written 2,000 or 3,000 years ago and apply it to people in the 21st century? You bump into that everywhere you turn. And uh, sometimes the best you can do is just acknowledge the problem. <laughs> you know, can't solve it. But even to acknowledge it says, oh, look, I understand that you've got problems with this. It's not normal to have talking snakes. It's not normal to have a tree in the garden with the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, just, that's not normal. So something is going on here with the biblical writers. They knew it wasn't normal. It's not as though they had talking snakes in their day. Uh, at least acknowledge that. I have some friends who are, uh, I guess, new Christians. But one is, was a, a geologist. He said to me, if I have to believe that the earth is 10,000 years old in order to be a Christian, I can't do it. He said, it's not as though I don't want to do it. I can't do it. Just as if uh, you read that uh, Jonas swallowed the whale, not the other way around, you'd read that, you couldn't believe that. You just can't. And if being a Christian means you've got to believe something like that, I can't do it. Because I, everything else tells me the earth is old. You've got to listen to that. Um, My, one of my close friends, Bruce Walkie, has uh, bought into, well, I guess it was theistic evolution. And, uh, but he, one of the reasons he did is he lives in the circles of people who have evidence for evolution. And it wasn't made up by some uh, granny who was teaching in the fifth grade and wanted to teach us the kids. The whole of the academic world buys into that. And it's not worth it <laughs> to insist 
Not, it's well worth it to insist that men and women were made by God. That they are special. You know, you can argue that. But it's not worth it to say. Uh, Earth is 10,000 years old. I know you're here and you're sure that's right. <laughs> but sure is tough to sell in this society. And it's tough to sell to Christians in this society. And one of the reasons that they, people don't witness is they run into things like that. I'm flying, and I sit, talk to the person next to me on the plane. <laughs> one of the things that happens is that the term evangelical has been politicized. If I, uh, I try not to let him know I'm a preacher, Tony Campalo says he gets on a plane, if he doesn't want to talk, People ask him what he does. He says, I'm a Baptist preacher. That kills it. <laughs> he says, if I say to them, I'm a, a sociologist, that conversation goes. Uh, I have learned that if they learn that I, if they know that I teach at a religious institution, the next question is, what kind of an institution? Well, it's a <laughs> seminary. Oh, uh, what brand? Well, we have all kinds of people. Uh, we have Presbyterians and Baptists, and, you know, I don't know, even have some Roman Catholics. They're a little more comfortable with that. But if they hear that we are evangelical, they have already decided we're right-wing Republicans. And we'd vote for Attila the Hun if we had a chance. <laughs> I mean, uh, and the only thing they know about evangelicals is that, that we are a percentage of the vote in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, so we have not been done a favor by the people who have politicized it, even the people on our team, because uh, the issue is not whether you are a right-wing Republican, the issue is are you right with Jesus Christ? And that's a different question. As the communication patterns have changed, as you described, and particularly when we go into a visual culture, what, uh, what advice do you have as we encounter people that want to uh, have, or, or, or use of video clips and images and um, kind of nonverbal type of uh, communication in sermons? Do you have some comments for us? Say that again, though, please. The world, as you have said, has shifted to a television world, a very visual-oriented one. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for us as preachers as we wrestle with including video clips or images, pictures along the way? Uh, and, there, and there's certainly pressure from the culture to, uh, to step up those types of messages. Uh, what, what guidelines do you have for us as we wrestle with those issues. I feel like a Luddite when you're talking about that. Uh, yeah. But uh, I th my rule is use what you can use and use it as an illustration that supports your sermon. Don't use film clips and whatever else is just to show that you're avant-garde and you're with it. Uh, but if that's the best way to get this truth across, then that's what I want to do. Uh, if you use a clip from a film, for the most part, it's better to use it up in the front rather than the, at the end. When Braveheart was a big film, I mean, a lot of the pastors used it, and they'd use it at the end. And they'd bring on Braveheart, and there would be the music, and there would be the stomping horses, and, you know. How, and, and then the preacher would want to get up and say something to finish it. You can't compete with that. <laughs> Talk about an anti-climax. Uh, so if you're going to use it at the end, it needs to end your sermon, and it needs to end it in a way that people understand what this was all about. <clears throat> but I have been in enough services where they have used the film clips and I'd say it's probably a 50-50 affair. 50% they got it right. The other 50%, uh, it didn't really help the sermon. It got in the way. 
<clears throat> so that's my rule. Use what you can to advance the sermon. And if you're not convinced that it advances the sermon, don't use it. On the other hand, I have a friend where his church invested, I think I write, 750,000 in a visual aid, or, you know, screens and project this whole bit. And uh, he said to me, it's a curse. He said, I thought it'd be a great idea, but he said, now, if people don't pay 750,000 for a system that you don't use. <laughs> and so now I find myself looking for clips to use because I have to justify this thing we bought. <laughs> and he said, I, you can't, as a preacher, you can't go looking for film clips. So you have to hire somebody to look for you and to run this system because it keeps breaking down. <clears throat> and now it costs you double what you paid for it because you got to pay a salary every week. And uh, you find sometimes that uh, somebody says, this is, this will fit. And then you watch it, it, do, it doesn't quite fit. It's like an illustration, it doesn't quite illustrate. And he said, I don't know it's been a good investment. Uh, but when you got it in the church and you put that kind of money out, you'll use it. Um, and uh, it may be to your detriment. I mean, your task and my task is to try to communicate. Anything that gets in the way of that is not good. Anything that supports that is good. Uh, Dr. Robertson, could you comment on the shift in preaching where we would do weeks in one book of the Bible to now uh, just topical uh, messages, still expositorily preach, but the, the topic is driving the sermon series for four weeks or ten weeks. Just curious what you're seeing and thoughts of that shift in preaching that. If I understand your question, it's if you preach through a book, each sermon has to be a complete unit. You can't depend that the people heard it, part of it last week and then they came back because they didn't come back. Uh, <laughs> The average church attendance is not every day of the month. Uh, so that uh, each sermon has to be a unit of itself. Introduction, body, conclusion. And you really can't say, I did this last week, I can carry it over. We face that with our radio program. Uh, we go through books of the Bible, we go through all kinds of things. <laughs> but we have found that we cannot it depend on the fact that the audience was here yesterday. They're not. So we have to go back and review and set it. Now, there are some folks who hear us every day, and they will write and say, wish you guys would move on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can't. I mean, you, uh, uh, today, the pattern of listening is so different than it used to be in the past. I don't know if that helps at all. Do, do you see any... Um downsides of preaching, focusing on the need, you know, the, the, the sermon series is designed on, on people's needs. So we design a sermon series around, say, marriage or hot topics or questions Jesus asked. And we're in different books of the Bible every week versus just anchoring like in Matthew or in Isaiah. Well, I'm more comfortable coming from a book of the Bible working with a passage and then saying, how does this apply to people today? What is the biblical message that goes across the culture? Uh, I, 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 this is just me. I just find that doing a topical message on marriage, uh, I am more likely in those messages to bring in from the outside support and the message itself outside the Bible and I don't have enough time with the people to do that. So, but that's my own feeling about it. Better to do the message and say, all right, what relevance does this have? Uh, Dr. Robinson, um, I know I, for one, and I'm, I suspect most of us, realize that a relatively small percentage of people's discipleship happens in that 30 minutes on Sunday morning. Um, 
it seems to me at least. Uh, what, what do you recommend for us as, uh, as pastors, preachers, to, to help make disciples uh, so that it's not just 30 minutes on Sunday morning for people? Russ could talk at 30, talk about it, it's 30 minutes to raise the dead. Um, sometimes I think it's 30 minutes to kill people. Uh, the uh, American Bible Society and Zinovan have a program now in which they are publishing the Bible like a book. Uh, the order of the books in the New Testament is Luke and Acts, and then uh, the letters are fit within that. The, the text has no numbers. It's published like a, an ordinary book. And they have people coming together, reading the, that text and discussing it. It has had remarkable success. Uh, and it has a, a couple of kinds of success. People will read this, and they read it like a book, so sometimes uh, they will have read 12, page, 12 chapters of a book and not even know they've done that. It, it catches the flow. And they uh, will supply uh, books, it's, I think it's seven ninety nine for each book, and they give you all kinds of support for it. They don't, the American Bible Society doesn't make any money out of it. Uh, but it, it does give a biblical understanding to people who, who read, and it's easier to read. Uh, my wife, who is a reader, uh, got hold of it, and she said, this is amazing. You, know, you, you read uh, 10, 12 chapters at a time, and don't even know you've done it. <clears throat> uh, so the numbers, they get, and the little chapter divisions, they all get in the way. Uh, so I think it's a way of helping people to be more biblically oriented. But you might contact the American Bible Society. It's a, it's a good program just come out. I, say, I think that's the, the story that's uh, being exhibited down, downstairs. Oh, is it? Good. It's a good book. Good. It's well worth taking a look at that. I appreciated your uh, comments about discernment in your first uh, uh, address this morning. Granted that there are local things in one's own church that you might address that take courage, what do you consider some of the bigger issues of the culture now that probably all of us need to speak out to and that require moral courage? I I, this is tricky business, but I don't hear anybody preaching about divorce. The Bible seems to me to say something about marriage and man leaves his father and mother. So nobody talks about divorce because too many people in the church have been divorced. Uh, the issue of homosexuality, uh, the, uh, the, the gay group, has been very clever at uh, ri rising up against anybody who says any word about that. And uh, they have learned to protest uh, somebody who is outspoken. And uh, what they have also done is cause people to say, my pastor is a bigot because of well, what they're doing. Uh, I think the uh, the issue of uh, money, finances, giving is less emphasized now because we don't want to appear to people to be hucksters in the marketplace. But on the other hand, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about money. You cannot serve God and mammon. So mammon is the opposite of serving God. And uh, a lot of people in our culture <laughs> serve mammon. Those are issues. I think another issue that we don't talk about is the theology of work. I'm involved with a group that's into that, going through the Bible, seeing what each book of the Bible may say about work. Uh, 
in one study that was done, 95% of the people say they have never heard a sermon on work. They never attended a seminar on work. <laughs> and that's where they spend their lives. Talk about being irrelevant. Uh, so that's another kind of issue that involves us today. Uh, at least the theology of work is trying to put together biblical material, theology of this, on this subject. I, I, I think we have done a fairly good job talking about abortion or uh, in, not in support of it, against it. Our biggest difficulty is that we can talk against abortion but not talk about the women who have to get one. Uh, this tremendous pain. Uh, so what do we have to say to somebody who uh, has been involved in an abortion. Uh, and it's, this is tricky business because if I thunder against it, I can cause people who have done, have an abortion, I think it's about 20% of our congregation, been that way, to feel this awful guilt and pain again. So it has to be done in a pastoral way, not a prophetic way. Dr. Robinson, uh, do you invite people to make a commitment to Christ as you preach, and how do you do that? Do you uh, ask people to make a commitment to Christ? And if you do, how do you ask them to make that commitment? Uh, good question. I do, uh, but what I usually do is uh, I will tell the people in the congregation that uh, Three weeks from now, we want to have an evangelistic, or at least an outreach ministry. On that day, we sing familiar hymns. And, uh, uh, and I try to give a clear gospel message. Hand out cards before the sermon, in which uh, everybody in the congregation is asked to fill out the card name, address, and then there would be life. I've trusted Jesus Christ today. I'd like to know more about Jesus Christ, you know, that sort of a thing. Uh, I'd like to have a Bible study I could do at home. But we ask everybody to fill it out. That way, a person who is there uh, feels freer to check that line because everybody's doing it. Uh, we, if we do it, you have to have some kind of follow-up so that uh, I tell them, if you check, the, if you'd like to know more about Christ or you've trusted Jesus Christ, they, somebody will call you and they'll get with you at your convenience, at your comfort place, just to talk to you about Jesus Christ. Nobody's going to try to get you to join this church. We might do that, but that's not what they're doing. They're here to help you understand what it means to become a Christ, follower of Christ. Uh, uh, God has used that. Uh, I think bringing people forward in a service to make a commitment. <laughs> you, your pastors, you have married people. You get, with the groom at least, he, he's over the side. I said to the group, now listen, just listen to me. If I say, will you, then your answer is I will. If I say, would you, your answer is I would, you know. <laughs> it's coming, he's over in the corner reciting those words. I mean, this is traumatic to be in front of a congregation, have to answer a question like that. Uh, so when people come forward, at a church and we uh, get, give them the card, they sign up. Uh, often they confuse the drama and the adrenaline with the moving of God in their lives. So if you're going to do something like that, be sure you have an opportunity to sit and talk to people. I know that even though I've tried to make the gospel as clear as possible, 
uh, people who come who are not a Christian, obviously, uh, they're almost traumatized by coming forward. That's why I use the method where we call them and, uh, and God in his grace has, has blessed it. Uh, I think there's a, a necessity on a, on a regular basis, not daily, uh, not every week, to plan to reach non-Christians who, if they're coming to your church. Um, we have a question over here. Dr. Robinson, over here. Oh. <laughs> uh, living in an information explosion age where there are pastors that publish their sermons and books, and they call them commentaries, uh, <laughs> and uh, where you can look on the internet and find just volumes of tremendous information. How do you balance using that information uh, in messages, and where does plagiarism and research and originality where is the fine line in all of this stuff? For example, uh, about 15 years ago, I had a student, uh, I had one of my children come home from Moody Bible Institute, and they heard me preach, and they said, Dad, I heard Joe Stoll preach that same sermon at Moody. And I said, well, then he got it from the same guy I did, and it was, <laughs> and it was Haddon Robinson. So. <laughs> I think you're owed royalties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. I, I, if something I have preached, you take and you use, use it. You don't have to give me credit for it. Just do it. Uh, I mean, what have we? Uh, we have not received uh, the danger of taking other people's material on a regular basis is you don't grow. Uh, you're, <laughs> it's take a whole sermon on its own. If you do that on a regular basis, uh, you don't grow. There's something about your own personal study, bringing the message together, that helps you. Avoid that step and uh, it doesn't help you much. And it gets shallow. Uh, I, I have friends who really believe that any time you take something from somebody else, it's, it's plagiarism. I don't know, if you take it from five people, it's scholarship. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not nearly as bothered by that as I am by the fact <laughs> that if you're gonna steal, steal from an upper class neighborhood. <laughs> And God help you to know the difference. Uh, I have, uh, I have friends I know who didn't go to seminary, but they have a ministry, and uh, and they need help to learn what to take. Uh, and, uh, there's some people that consistently give out good material. Uh, but if you only take the stuff that appeals to you, in a sense, you, you hurt, and you hurt your people. If you get good material, uh, <laughs> Spurgeon knew that people stole his stuff. He published it. Uh, he'd go over it again on Monday, and he'd publish it, so send it by telegraph across the country. Uh, across the ocean. Uh, I don't, I really don't have the conscience about that that other people do. Uh, one thing is certain though, if you take somebody else's material as you publish it, <laughs> you got problems in River City. Uh, because then, uh, uh, well, Peter Marshall, you may remember him, he's chaplain of the Senate. Uh, his wife published his material. And much of it uh, uh, was plagiarized, it took it from somebody else. 
He had no problem and nobody got on his back because he used that in his church. When she published it, she didn't know he had taken it, <laughs> gave no credit for it. And all at once, the wrath of the preachers came down on him. Uh, one of the things you can do to help that is if you take material from somebody else, put that in your bulletin to say parts of the sermon today came from commentaries like, and then uh, parts of the sermons came from uh, uh, preachers like Joe Stoll and Haddon Robinson. Just put it in the bulletin. Uh, that's honest, it's above board. Uh, and, and people don't sit there and say, oh, that's terrible. They, sometimes they wonder where you got it from. So, anyhow. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Robinson, um, you're, you seem to be such a, 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 an astute observer of you know, the changing of culture, and especially within the church. Um, what do you see today in, in terms of whether it's the style or the substance, or even some of the winds that, of doctrine that, that float through? What do you see that excites you and what concerns you about the way church is done now? Try that one more time. What about the way, you know, you've seen church morph. You've seen yeah. morphing and, and changing the way church is done. What about the way church is done now? What excites you and what really concerns you? <laughs> what concerns me is, and I was talking about that this morning, to tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. Uh, and that seems to me the example given by people who use secular literature and secular sources to say in the name of God what God isn't saying. Uh, there's a lot of that, that goes on. Uh, and there is a reaction today against biblical preaching by people who do it poorly. Uh, it's pedantic, it's like a lecture at Bible college or seminary. Uh, that concerns me. It just concerns me that people are bored by our preaching. And boredom is not only bad communication, it's a destroyer of life and hope. I mean, to think that if Sunday after Sunday they sit in church and they are bored, they end up being bored with God and bored with Christ and bored with the Bible. And you can't do that today, that's a real penalty, eh? Yeah. That concerns me a great deal. Uh, the Bible is great literature. I say to our students, uh, this is not a, a plug, it's just the Bible is great literature, and great literature appeals to the total person. Uh, appeals to them intellectually, appeals to them emotionally, it grips them. Uh, so don't ignore the fact that it's good literature, I mean, great literature, really. Um, and if other books like modern novels grip you, the Bible can grip you. And uh, you must have had that experience. You're, you're not studying for a sermon, you know, you know, you're just reading the Bible, and you get engrossed in it. Because the literature is, you know, you're not asking, what is it telling me about God? Or, it's just a great story. And uh, I don't think we have conveyed that well to the people in our congregation. Thank you. I wanted to ask one question, then I'll give you opportunity to any final words that uh, pearls of wisdom. We'll get you give a final pearl. But one more question I have. When we stand up to preach on a Sunday, it's clear that we're not only speaking to men, that there are lots of women. Sometimes, in most churches, the majority of the people we speak to are women. Um, I've noticed you are a man. <laughs> Good observation on your part. Keen of the uh, yeah, yeah. um, sense of the obvious. How do you speak to women as a man? How do you make sure that women uh, fully understand 
uh, biblical truth as you stand up to explain it and preach it. Well, just a little thing. This morning, because it was a men's audience, but um, sometimes I take the uh, illustration and I, instead of talking about a man, I talk about a woman. Uh, I was in Australia a while ago and I talked about coming home, discovering that your child was ill and you race across uh, Sydney to get to the hospital and the surgeon is there, the right surgeon, and she takes that child and she, uh, I do that a lot, <laughs> but a couple of the women, I was out jogging after the service, said, I really appreciate that. That's the first time we've ever heard a woman referred to positively in the pulpit. Uh, if I'm talking about a professional person and to a mixed audience, I spend time talking about making the reference to a woman or a man. Oh. So I, I, I'm Alice Matthews, who is on my radio program, <laughs> may be very conscious of that. And uh, sometimes I will sit down with my wife and I'll say, this is what I want to illustrate. Tell me, as a woman, what would work, what wouldn't work. Uh, most of our illustrations are neutral. But if I have a choice of going with a man or a woman, I'll go with a woman, because my tendency is to go, go with a man. But um, <laughs> what taught me the lesson was I was directing the Christian Medical Dental Association. And I was talking about a study that was done at the uh, University of uh, Wisconsin. And it really just concerned men. I mean, it bailed. And I came off that study using it. And no sooner was I this, through with my lecture, two women came up and they said, you didn't refer to a woman in your whole talk. And I said, look, all the studies I could find had to do with men. I said, then don't use them in a mixed audience. And I realized uh, that issue today is an important issue. Uh, if, you, if you have a mixed audience, you have to, ought to have mixed illustrations. Uh, women are too crucial not to appreciate them. And, uh, so that's the most conscious thing I do. Uh, works. Good, thank you. As we get ready to wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to, uh, to say to us? Well, sometimes I say to our students, listen to conversations. Listen to the way people talk to one another. Good novelists do that. Uh, what kind of language do they use? What kind of images do they have? Uh, there's something that people, when you use their talk in such a way that, uh, you know, you don't point it out, you just do it. People sense, yeah, that's the language of the heart. It's my language. I, I've been in those conversations. Uh, so uh, if you can do that, you'd be a better communicator. Hey, by the way, thanks a million for just sitting and listening. It's been great to be with you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.